Welcome to the uh, latest installment of the NYU Game Center Lecture Series. I'm very excited to have Matt Bach uh, tonight. Um, he's one of the core faculty here at the NYU Game Center and uh, a brilliant uh, game designer, um, project director at, uh, at Harmonix, where he has worked on a number of uh, famous, uh, important, uh, uh, super successful game uh, series like Rock Band and Dance Central. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I first, uh, I first really encountered you when we invited you to come speak at practice. Yep. And um, Matt came uh, to practice and gave a talk about Dance Central. And uh, a big part of that talk was the ways in which the different moves in Dance Central were made available to the player um, through different kinds of like choices and, and menu systems. And it was, um, a lot of it was about the question of gender and how these different moves were gendered. Because in dance, there's this whole tradition of certain moves and certain styles being associated with uh, either men or with women. And, 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 and the, the design team was wrestling with this question. Like, should we, you know, in, in what ways should we organize these moves and make them explicitly gendered. And the, the, the kinds of design solutions that, that you came up with were so subtle and so interesting. And, and the, the, the sort of openness with which you allowed people to kind of mix and match these different moves in ways that weren't overdetermined uh, by traditional gender roles, I just thought was amazing. It blew me away. You were, uh, Matt was, uh, his, it wasn't just the solution that, that, that you came up with, but it was the whole way you approached the problem and the way you thought about it. And I think it's really indicative of, the, of now that I know you better, uh, about the way you think about games and I think pop culture in general, like the, the ways in which you have this kind of deep appreciation for, um, for the importance of subtle details in, in pop culture, that it's not just a matter of the sort of big big explicit meanings that people put on games as messages, you know, and they're, that look to games to make some kind of big declarative statement about big important issues. Um, but it's in fact in the subtle details of how menu systems work, you know, that the real work of like the, the ways that pop culture influences uh, our, the way we think about, about gender roles, for example, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of the importance of, the, of details, the importance of style, um, and, and all of these other kind of subtle questions of, of, of culture and games. Um, and so, uh, you know, everybody talks about VR, but uh, very few people are doing anything about it. <laughs> and I think that I'm, I'm excited to hear how you guys are wrestling with this question as you, as you uh, sort of update uh, Rock Band uh, for for virtual reality and it's like really thinking about the affordances of this new thing. So um, that's the, the 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 topic that I think you're going to share with us tonight. I'm really excited to hear about it. Um, but before we begin, uh, a quick round of thanks to the people that make the the those people who support the NYU uh, Game Center lecture series, um, whose names are uh, <laughs> I've totally forgotten to write it down. Fresh Planet, of course. Um, also, uh, next, uh, uh, Viacom Next, um, the, also uh, Dots, uh, our, our friends at Dots, um, and, uh, and, and at least those three, <laughs> probably one I've forgotten and I apologize to, who? Avalanche, oh my god, of course, Avalanche, the biggest, coolest studio in New York City. Um, and who else? If I've forgotten someone else, I'm going to have to really like overdo the praise on them. So um, I think we're good. I think we're good. Uh, so thanks to, to all of them. And with no further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Matt Bach. Thanks so much, Frank. It's a really nice intro. Um, so <laughs> one, one of the... Uh, 
things that I just want to say as before, sort of a little preamble before we get into this, is that this game's not done. Uh, when I scheduled this lecture series, I thought it might be, uh, but it's not. Uh, so uh, it starts off with how I spent my summer vacation, and then this is going to end with how I'm going to spend my winter break. Uh, so don't be surprised if the final product varies from uh, things that we discuss here, and uh, without uh, any more preamble, we're going to get right into it. So Frank did a good job uh, already introducing me, but I just want to talk a little bit about my relationship with the Rock Band franchise. Largely my relationship with the Rock Band franchise in terms of software design was really peripheral. I just made a terrible pun because what I actually worked on was the hardware. Uh, the, uh, my first job at Harmonix was just being like a production assistant and I had been building my own weird art arcade games which had taught me a little bit about electrical engineering. I started fixing all of the broken instruments uh, and soon found myself a member of the hardware team. That didn't last too long. I went on to start working on the Dance Central series. I was one of the few people in the studio who was just like hugely interested in making a dance game. Uh, I was kind of tired of rock, which I'll get into a bit more. Um, so I worked on the prototype that would become Dance Central, eventually became the creative director of that franchise. I worked on uh, Fantasia Music Evolved as the creative director. I was the writer on a tiny Steam game called A City Sleeps, which is a music-oriented shmup. And uh, then I was a product manager and mobile engineer for Beat Sports. So the point of all this is really just that I'm deeply familiar with designing for new interfaces, platforms, and paradigms. Arguably the only traditional video game I've ever worked on, I was the writer for. Uh, everything else was a custom controller or a motion controller. No traditional two joysticks, two, bu two bumpers, two triggers, no keyboard and mouse. Uh, and let's just introduce a little bit of the RBVR team. They'll scroll past you here. Uh, everything that we've been working on uh, is the product of our team. We're about 30 or so people. Uh, and so when uh, I'm discussing we, these are the fine people that I'm referring to. I'm blessed to work with an incredibly uh, talented and, uh, and diverse set of folks on this, uh, this franchise. Uh, so going into Rock Band VR presented two real major challenges for me. One, I don't really care for rock music or culture anymore. Uh, and there's also a sort of team ch challenge. This is that like VR's core premise is this sense of presence or of immersion and playing classic rock band is antithetical to a sense of presence. I'm gonna de delve into that in much more detail, but first I'm gonna exercise my demons a little bit. Rock is so boring. Rock is so tired. I don't even know who this band is and I know that I won't like them. <laughs> I've played in a lot of bands. This is my band. We were called The Main Drag. I've gone on tour. I may be overly familiar with rock tro tropes and the genre. It doesn't really have any appeal for me at all anymore. It seems antiquated and irrelevant in 2016 and I don't think rock is ever going to change the world again. I think it's lost its cultural relevancy and urgency and is largely the territory of nostalgia acts and revival crap. Boring rehashes that I have no interest in. And I fear that anyone who argues that punk rock or rock are vital in America right now are deluding themselves with a mix of rockism, nostalgia, and a lazy myopia that leads one to believe that forming a band which requires having a fucking van to lug around hundreds of pounds of equipment is somehow the most accessible way of making music. It's easier and cheaper than using your phone or your laptop and then recording yourself using the microphone that's in your phone and your laptop. This is the kind of amazing global music that we hear now. And so rock, uh, kunk, yes. This scrappy form of electronic music, these are a bunch of friends of mine, a kind of Brooklyn-based collective making uh, awesome uh, dance music. And this is, this is more vital, in my opinion, than, the, than rock could ever dream of being right now. It's the closest we have to something that feels to me like the vitality that punk rock had in the early 80s. And this kind of dance music is in no way any less compelling, complex, or interesting a cultural form, despite what rockists might have you think. So maybe I'm sick of rock, but whenever, what, let's ask the question, how did I get here? One of my favorite bands there, Talking Heads. So why am I the lead designer on Rock Band VR? 
mostly because I absent this cultural critique from my professional work. I don't think it would be viable for me to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Not, not to say that I don't let my team know this every once in a while, but uh, it is not the thing that I like greet every day with. Uh, <laughs> I worry about the damage that continued focus rock does in terms of perpetuating rockism and rock centrism, but it's not really a primary concern in my life. I'm happy if other people like rock and roll. It's just not my thing. I'm personally novelty seeking, easily bored, and I only want the new next thing. Uh, and initially, I wasn't really excited about working on Rock Band VR at all, and I wasn't, uh, because it felt to me like it was going to be something like a throwback, a nostalgia act, VOM. But before I get there, I want to define a little bit of terms just to bring you better into the problem space that I'm exploring. Uh, this concept of immersion, it's long been an end goal for some percentage of game developers, not myself. I've been uh, interested largely in a kind of inverted version of immersion, wherein the game space opens up into the world around the game rather than the space that you are in being subsumed within the game. I would argue that that's what Dance Central does. It creates a space wherein the space you are in becomes part of the game. Uh, in any case, lots of game designers want to transport their players to new and different worlds, have them forget about their surroundings, and be totally laser focused on the world that you've created for them. So in theoretical writing, and I'm, I'm not, like this is literally like what happens if you search for VR immersion on Wikipedia. I'm not suggesting that I have any in-depth theory, but I think it's important to think about how to cut apart terms like immersion, which are very loaded. So the way this has been done in the past is to think about uh, different types of immersion, tactical immersion, strategic immersion, narrative immersion. Uh, there are analogs in that in sensory motor immersion, cognitive immersion, emotional immersion, spatial immersion. So tactical or sensory motor immersion is this thing that we would say is akin to flow state. The player is demonstrating skill in a tough challenge that's right at the bounds of their capabilities. As opposed to strategic immersion or cognitive immersion, you're sort of lost in thought about the best course of action to take in a given game. You're contemplating the chessboard. Uh, or narrative and emotional more immersion is this more traditional kind of holodeck notion, lost in a fantasy of sorts, invested in a story character's world, not necessarily transported in the same way as the holodeck. That's what we would say is spatial immersion, or what, we, what VR, uh, the VR industry has dubbed presence. The sense that you're truly transported, that the simulation is sufficiently robust as to give you the impression that you are truly somewhere else. So that's the question. How is Rock Band immersive? If we take a look at the marketing materials and sort of pop cultural discourse around Rock Band and Guitar Hero and other band-oriented games, uh, they would suggest that, uh, that the, their success is due to wish fulfillment and that by playing the game, people are able to live out a rock star fantasy. And uh, there are folks at Harmonix that believe this sincerely and I would hypothesize that the success of the game is due to fulfilling a fundamental human desire to perform music. I'm a bit too convinced of the power of culture to shape desire to believe that desires are fundamental, but that's entirely besides the point. Regardless, that said, this perspective might one, lead one to believe that the game is narratively immersive, but I'm unconvinced. So how about strategic immersion? So there really was a rock band strategy guide, but I'll save you $9.99 to tell you the following. Here is the strategy to beat rock band. First, you hit all the notes. Second, you deploy overdrive at points in time of the largest note density, maximal note density, and there is no step three. Why anyone paid $9.99 for that book is totally beyond me. Uh, but I don't think anyone has ever experienced a notion of strategic immersion playing classic rock band, nor really any other rhythm game that I can think of for that matter. As far as narrative immersion goes, there are lots of moments in, in Rock Band 1 through 4 that deal with your band's narrative, and they're totally charming, but I think they're far from central to the experience. They're sort of like an aesthetic dressing around the experience. Sure, we had character customization, equipment customization, vignette interstitials, which is what is shown here, uh, that star your band, you could buy a van, go on tour, sell out, blah, blah, blah. But you never really get to know enough about your band's journey to be truly invested in them. They don't really have a story. F from my perspective, the story is about you and your friends in the room playing rock band. I think that it's all about tactical immersion. It's this hyper-challenging sensory motor task. And if you've played this game or any other rhythm game at harder expert levels, you know how impossible a given level feels at first. But with practice, you acclimate to the visual prompts, and a few weeks later, you're in the throes of flow state, pulling off a full combo performance of green grass and high tides. This process of achieving flow is the beating heart of rock band and most every HUD-based rhythm game. When we talk about gameplay at Harmonix, we're usually just talking about flow state. Flow is central to what Harmonix is as a cultural producer, 
I kind of consider of us like purveyors of fine flow states since 1998. In terms of spatial immersion, I think that here is where it becomes incredibly difficult to resolve this notion of presence from a VR standpoint and gameplay immersion in terms of classic rock band. To achieve the level of flow state that you do within Rock Band, the player's attention must be fully aimed at the gem highway. It's hypnotizing, it's alluring, there's almost a symbiosis between you and the HUD. Your eyes barely move from it. And it's where you are when you're playing Rock Band at a high skill level. You're not in your living room on your couch. You're not even really on stage with your digital bandmates in any way. You're basically on that note highway. You might as well be that note highway. But presence is the promise of VR, AKA spatial immersion. We had none of it in terms of classic rock band. But it's not quite fair. Uh, in the early days of uh, rock band VR, we started to bookend the experience with, uh, with little bits of things that felt present, right? We introduce you and you're on the stage and then uh, you start playing rock band. This is classic rock band in VR. So uh, our absolute V1, Ooh, this is slightly odd. This got reformatted. Sorry. Um, the, the initial Rock Band VR gameplay uh, was a rock band that you would remember from a decade ago, just sort of superimposed onto a monitor in front of you. Notes streamed down tracks by the dozen, and the effect was identical to basically how we demo Rock Band at events like GamerX or PAX or E3. The band has monitors, like a real band, but these monitors are showing Rock Band, not playing back audio for the band to hear. And if you look at these various pictures of people playing rock band uh, at PAX or uh, GamerX or otherwise, uh, you'll note that not, not one of them is making eye contact with the crowd. Uh, maybe sometimes the singer is, but anyone who's playing the streaming note game is staring at the monitors, even though dozens of people are watching. Everyone's enraptured by the flow of notes. They're hypnotized. They're immersed. So that was what Rock Band VR was, circa GDC 2016. You walked on stage, you felt that you were present in this particular club, you saw your bandmates play, and then the song began and you basically looked at what was a television screen on the floor. And we showed this at GDC last year and we were really weren't ready with any of the new gameplay stuff we were starting to experiment with. Uh, and we got actually a quite positive reaction to this, uh, but we personally were not quite satisfied with it. And it wasn't lost on players or the press either. Uh, There's a quote from a Polygon early look. Some of the virtual tricks that Harmonix pulls off are admittedly pretty neat. Less appealing though is keeping your eyes locked on Rock Band's Note Highway. Makes you feel like you're in a shoegaze band. <laughs> Around the same time, uh, uh, or I guess uh, at, at OC3 this year, I think uh, Carmack uh, crystallized a feeling that we were kind of having around this experience was that we were kind of coasting on novelty, the initial wonder of being something that people have never seen before. Uh, and Carmack's saying here, we need to start judging ourselves not on a curve, but in an absolute sense. Can you do something that VR has, in VR, that has more value than what these non-VR things have done? And if I was going to fill my presentation with memes, I suppose this would be like the challenge accepted guy would show up. Uh, but it's been a concern at Harmonix forever. We pride ourselves in approaching new design spaces on their own terms. We're suspicious of the novelty factor because we know it wears off. Dance Central was a Kinect game, but it was a robust and deep game, as was Fantasia Music Evolved, as was Rock Band. And all these games could seem just gimmicky, novelty, disposable at first glance. So we started trying to put the HUD in different places to try and coax people to look at more of the venue and feel more present. But ultimately what happened was that they were just doing exactly the same thing except for now their necks were sore because they were craning them over to the side and just sitting the entire time like this playing rock band. Uh, we'd failed from our perspective in terms of making something that was immersive in terms of giving this, the feeling of presence of being on stage, being in a rock club, while also being a kind of rock gameplay. So we started to rethink this from the ground up and went after this notion of a performance mode. So performance mode is what I'm gonna to use to talk about kind of early experiments within this space. And when we get to what ended up cementing as Rock Band VR gameplay, I'll call that Rock Band VR gameplay. So here's a slide from the, the, the green light deck for, uh, for Rock Band VR. When we were first starting to do this and we're getting internal approvals in the company to do so, uh, this was our our notion of kind of where we thought gameplay would land. So we decided that we're gonna capture a broader range of performance in the interest of trying to give players an emotional, emotional and spatial immersion that we knew was right for VR. 
we wanted to incorporate all these different aspects into the core loop. Of course, lots of these sort of fell away as we progressed through development. Um, but we broke up into four different prototyping teams, some of which were going to investigate motions and stances. Others worked on this casual mode, which we called freestyle rhythm, uh, which was going to be an attempt to make a kind of playful toy-like experience of playing guitar within rock band. Uh, others started to delve into freestyle solo visuals. And the final team started to work on the most cryptic of all of these, SGP, uh, which is not like the silly clown posse uh, or silly guy posse. Uh, it is simple guitar play. Uh, so just to go through some of the things that we experimented with early on and, and, uh, and discarded, uh, we discarded vocals relatively early. So the mic does work in Rock Band VR. If you go up to the mic and start singing in it, it will work like a microphone. Uh, but we found that the amount of like HUD support, et cetera, we had to have in order to encourage people to sing uh, was, was uh, not commensurate to the number of people who wanted to play Rock Band VR and sing in it. Uh, but our exploration to motions and stances was much more fruitful. Uh, well, uh, so when you buy Rock Band VR, it comes with this odd clip that's going to attach to the back of your Rock Band guitar. And that's going to allow you to position and, uh, and, and look at your Rock Band guitar in VR in a sort of one-to-one -one way. So you can detect which Rock Band guitar you have, the clip clips on in a very particular place, and then your guitar is kind of translated one-to-one -one within the world of Rock Band. And as I show some video later, you'll be able to see that. Um, and this allowed us, with the addition of knowing where the headset was in space, to start tracking a broader variety of stances and motions than we had in Rock Band before. Prior to that, we had done the sort of like single tilt thing to deploy your overdrive, but we hadn't really delved into uh, the various kind of rock genre performance uh, from a motion standpoint. So uh, taking a cue from these tropes, we decided to track things like head banging, like playing on your knees, doing the kind of ZZ top move thing, uh, playing the guitar behind your head, playing the guitar with your mouth. Uh, and we hooked it up so that the other band members would copy your actions when you did motions like this. Playtesters actually got a kick out of convincing their bandmates to head bang along with them. But the thing that was most uh, in depth and difficult, I think, in terms of our early experiments in performance gameplay was this notion that we were calling simplified beat, beat matchers or simple guitar play. Uh, the theory was that we could only reduce the complexity of this core task of playing rock band and we could make a HUD that people would not be hypnotized by, that they wouldn't be sucked in by. And I'm just going to show you all the different ways that we failed at doing that. So here are our goals. We want to prompt actions in a way that match the guitar part well enough to give a reasonable illusion of playing that guitar part. We want to let players hit a minimum level of execution quite easily and reward players for more precise execution. So we kind of split up this task into thinking about the button hand, fretting hand, and the strumming hand, and tried to think about how, simp how simple we could possibly make this. Um, so we didn't include the no a notion of note density here, like how many things you have to do, uh, because difficulty in classic rock band is defined by note density, and we could just go and play easy and medium and see whether we could look away from that for long enough uh, for it to work. Ultimately, it wasn't really simple enough. Players felt they had to look at the scrolling track regardless and anticipate the next note. That, that time of anticipation was not a thing they could internalize in any way, uh, such that they would trust it enough to look away. Furthermore, it's harder to play easy and medium rock band by ear, uh, given that the hard and expert parts tend to be authored uh, to the rhythm of the guitar part. So if you're listening to the guitar part and strumming along with it, you're much more likely to be strumming the rhythm of a hard guitar part or an expert guitar part. Okay, so our strum bar hand, which plays rhythms in classic rock band, is going to continue to do so here, maybe, right, in our first three options. Uh, or as we get more and more simple, we could just kind of pay attention to whether you're strumming at all and not really judge the rhythm so much as the presence or absence of strumming. That's what we call spam. Uh, as for the button hand, we figured it could kind of move in a direction relative to the pitch of the original part. So, oh, the guitar part's going up, you have to move, move up. The guitar part's going down, you have to move down. Uh, or it could just move when the pitch changes without regard to directionality. Uh, or you could just kind of spam with this hand, play rhythms with this hand, or spam with both. Okay, so uh, this first prototype we called contour mode. Uh, and in your right, in your, I mean, if, if you're in your rhythm hand, strum bar hand, you're playing the rhythm of the song, uh, and in your button hand, you're moving relative to the pitch. Uh, it's a little hard to see because of contrast, but let me 
uh, just highlight what, uh, what's going on here. So you can see that like these node gems span a handful of lanes. So each queue could be played on at least two different buttons. Any queue that came down the center could be played on any of the three center buttons. And this was great for a few songs, especially those with really repetitive, iconic guitar parts. Uh, but ultimately, people ended up staring at it basically all the time. It wasn't that much easier or, or more accessible or uh, less visually uh, arresting than traditional rock band. Uh, we made another prototype so where you're playing rhythms and you can just kind of do whatever button presses you want. So we're just sort of showing you the rhythms you have to strum at as they're coming towards you. And as long as you're doing something with your left hand, we're like, that's pretty good. Keep doing it. And we're playing the guitar part back for you. And for, uh, for a number of songs, this actually felt pretty good. Uh, but if you started to not be sincere in your attempts to play it, it stopped feeling good immediately. So it kind of relied on you fi fi filling in the gaps yourself. Uh, and then our final prototype was just this kind of spam mode thing. So this was the world's most expensive version of red light, green light. Uh, some folks like this, but it was increasingly hard for all of us to feel like we were playing the part at all at a certain point. We never ended up making a prototype wherein you play rhythm and then you can move when the pitch changes, but not based on direction, because we couldn't really figure out how to re communicate on our track a requirement for an ambiguous change in direction. It's easy for us to say, hey, move down or move up, but move is a kind of hard command to stream at someone uh, on a track that is implicitly spatial, because it's coming to the buttons, you're looking at it as a, as a spatial uh, system. What we found overall is just the less that we required the player to do, the less that they were convinced that they were playing the guitar part. As things became more simple, they became less convincing. And this illusion is absolutely key to the appeal of Rock Band, and we were breaking it. Moreover, no matter what, everyone still stared at the HUD. When we took this to playtest, we realized we were just failing at directing the player's attention from scrolling beatmatch HUD, which is just amazing to look at. It's just great. Like, it really is. Uh, but it's, it, it's an antithetical to what we're trying to do. So this led us to try and incentivize not looking at it. <laughs> because we can tell where you're looking in VR, uh, we would just bribe you with more points to, to like paper over our design failure. We're like, we couldn't figure it out, but we're going to give you points if you act like we did. Uh, <laughs> this is terrible. Ugh. We were stuck. Meanwhile, you know, the, the motions team was doing great. They had a handful of motions, uh, and our solo visuals team was, uh, was building this kind of awesome, uh, amazing solo visual system, which uh, has, enough has been said about uh, in terms of the live performance of Rock Band VR that happened around practice. Um, the concept was we're going to use this freestyle solo system that we built for Rock Band 4, but pair it with gorgeous abstract 3D visuals that were reactive to the play that you were doing. And these were easily people's favorite parts of Rock Band VR in the early days. They were free to look around, their music was visualized in the world, and with no HUD to distract them, they felt presence. They were spatially immersed. They felt like they were on stage. But we were kind of uncomfortable with this, largely because the Rock Band 4's freestyle solo mode was pretty controversial. It had been our flagship new feature, and tons and tons of work and iteration went into the audio technology we used to string together licks to generate unique solos in real time. However, plenty of people uh, have a kind of orthodoxy around the original guitar solos and felt like this was sacrilege in order like, to, be, to be kind of spewing your own notes over these things that had been in, in, like exquisitely crafted by artisans. Those people just are not going to like this, and they, they are not that much fun, probably. <laughs> so at the other kind of simple, accessible mode that I mentioned when I showed you that initial performance mode slide was this notion of freestyle rhythm guitar, this kind of casual mode, toy-like mode, where you're going to play uh, a, a kind of uh, guitar synthesizer uh, within the world of Rock Band VR. And so our audio team had embarked on this crazy quest, and the idea was that there might be this audience that just wanted a rock simulator, that didn't care to have a gameplay experience at all. And we introduced a number of different chord types, and to play freestyle rhythm guitar, you really just like hold these shapes, and you strum. And so uh, if you hold a single note, it's gonna make a single note 
uh, uh, guitar sounds that move along with the chords of the song kind of always sound good. Uh, if you hold three buttons in a row, it's going to play a bar chord. That's going to sound like a nice, uh, a nice fully voiced chord. You can play kind of muted power chords. Something's going to sound a little more punk rock or metal by holding just two buttons. It doesn't matter where you hold them on the neck. Uh, and you really don't have to look at the guitar once you've internalized these set of chord types. We also generate a series of different strum speeds. So you could play these different uh, chords at different strum speeds. And you know, since then, we've introduced even faster ones than these. Uh, but essentially, you can play this really gorgeous sounding, highly resolved guitar synthesizer inside the world of Rock Band VR. And all of a sudden, we found fun. Devs were staying late just to do this. We knew we were onto something. But we found fun in a mechanically devoid space, which was worrying. And to go back to the Rock Band 4 freestyle guitar thing, we had reason to believe this was kind of a dangerous path. Freestyle guitar solos in Rock Band VR were not universally loved. If you want to watch someone peel them apart, watch the zero punctuation review of Rock Band 4. Uh, they were notably lacking in rich gameplay, and over time, our players drifted away from them. We found similar results when we put non-musicians in front of freestyle rhythm guitar. They felt unmoored. We were determined that this was the right direction, so we soldiered on because we knew what we had was fun, because we were having fun with it. We just had to find players, we just had to find a way to get players to see the value that we saw in it, and to get them to play with it like we played with it. Uh, so that came down ultimately to try and create this thing that we would dub creative gameplay, fact or fiction. So creative gameplay has sort of been a holy grail or white whale for harmonics for a really long time. It dates back to the very founding of harmonics, the desire to allow players to create, not just recreate. So the absolute first thing harmonics made was an extension of an MIT project by the two co-founders, Alex Rogopoulos and Arana Gozi. Uh, and it was called The Axe, and it's a joystick that allows you to solo over popular songs. Uh, this thing is absolutely bonkers, so I'm going to show you a video of it. It is about the most 90s that things could possibly get. Uh, let me just move back from my highlighter to, come on. Never mind, the video is not going to work. Um, I will, OK, I'll show you the video. Yes. I'll show it to you on something else. One second. Uh, so. Basically, whenever we have started to build games at, uh, at Harmonix, there inevitably becomes a discussion about like, how we're going to add creativity into them. And in some of the early uh, games that we made, uh, we incorporated uh, things like a remix mode in amplitude and frequency. Uh, and these have never really been the most popular uh, aspects of any of the games. Uh, however, they are uh, they are the things that we get most excited about making. Okay, so here's, uh, here's what the axe grooves looks like. A little bit of a tutorial. good part where you get to control claymation uh, players with your joystick over beautiful rock songs. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, <laughs> so, this has been a, a sort of central theme for, uh, for harmonics for a long time, and this desire to facilitate and enable player expression can be seen in some of our subsequent titles as well, uh, but it's notably absent from our biggest successes. Uh, so, you know, Guitar Hero, Rock Band, Dance Central, don't really have significant pl places of, uh, that above, about player creativity, whereas Frequency and Amplitude uh, have their remix modes, and Fantasia Music Evolved was 100% about letting players add their own unique twist to music, but those certainly weren't our biggest, uh, our biggest games. So, <laughs> uh, 
I love that I'm being trolled by the X. If players aren't, so we have these, these very core problems that we found uh, over and over again when we start to build creative oriented gameplay or creation oriented gameplay. So if players aren't prompted, they don't know where to start. So the question becomes, how can we prompt without prescribing? Every one of our experiences uh, that we've made has had these issues appear in them over and over again. At times they seem intract intractable. So this is kind of this, uh, so when you have this question, how do you prompt without prescribing, what we're pointing to is this tension between instruction and choice. If we pile on too many instructions, the player is going to lose the ability to choose. And if we have too few instructions, the player is not going to know what's expected of them. Furthermore, uh, rock band trades on repeat play of a set of songs. If players aren't scored, they often lose interest in playing a song again. So how can we assign a score to creative output? Some days, it, it, and oftentimes, it feels like there's an unbridgeable gap between qualitative expression and quantitative scoring. So we're internalizing these. Instruction versus choice and creative freedom versus scoring. Uh, these are things that are constantly on my mind and are very central to the kinds of problems that we tried to solve within Rock Band VR. Uh, all the while, I want to also point to this additional problem we're trying to solve, uh, which I was talking about just a few minutes back, but it's easy to lose track of these things. Uh, gameplay versus spatial immersion. We're still facing the tension that we always faced, uh, the aforementioned tension between gameplay and immersion. All of the rich proto uh, prompting, juicy feedback, et cetera, in core rock band gameplay is immersion breaking. So we'd ultimately inadvertently bit off two of the hardest problems I'd, saw, I'd ever faced in my design career. How do we spatially immerse people while they're playing a game that cues them to do rhythms? And how do we create a competitive, creative system that rewards repeat play and assigns a value to creative output and prompts without prescribing? So I started to chart our narrow window for success. This is uh, some of our various explorations and where they chart on these axes between too much instruction, too little instruction, too much feedback, too little feedback, too many choices, and too few choices. And we have this kind of incredibly narrow window of success where freestyle rhythm gameplay is ideally going to be placed. Uh, so I mapped out this sweet spot while trying to diagnose the conditions that I thought had killed off the previous exper experiments. Classic rock band had too much feedback, causing HUD hypnosis, blah, blah, blah. I made a bunch of terms that we could use to point to specific issues that we had encountered before. So if we started to go down that same path, someone could say, no, 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 no. This is going to lead us to X, Y, or Z. Uh, we had a narrow path to success, but having kind of charted out the, the, uh, the periphery of it, we knew we could see where the guardrails were and we could maybe steer our way along there. So we started to build out what would actually become Rock Band VR gameplay. So here's the components of Rock Band VR gameplay. We have something called chord cues. We have something called combos. We have something called combo cues. A mechanic called chord following. In addition to probably the only thing that's recognizable here from traditional Rock Band, which is overdrive. But even overdrive works differently than it does in traditional Rock Band incorporate stances and motions. So uh, the very first thing we added to the freestyle rhythm guitar play system that allows you to fret those different chords and strum how you like is a chord cue. So at the top of every section, we're going to give you a particular chord to play. You're going to perform that chord, that shape, uh, within one measure, four beats of that prompt appearing. And that's going to happen periodically throughout the song as we transition from verse to pre-chorus to chorus, etc. Uh, this is a super simple mechanic. It's perhaps the most decompressed version of Rock Band you could possibly imagine. Uh, one prompt at the start of each song section. Does anyone want to guess what happened when we put players in front of this? Uh, that uh, <laughs> certainly uh, that, that, that happened a little bit. Um, but they just assumed that ultimately that's what we wanted them to do. That like, well, we told them in, in our preamble, hey, you can play whatever you want. They would just play that one chord and just stick with it. They were like, yeah, the game told me to do this. This must be good. We couldn't convince them to draw. We could only convince them to color within the lines. They would never experiment outside of that. So we started to think about what kinds of gameplay systems we could build that would reward experimentation. 
We need a mechanic that would encourage players to attempt more complex expression within our gameplay system. And thinking about our input system, we realized its commonalities with things like fighting games, extreme sport games, and open racing games like Forza Horizon. Players have a number of primitive actions that they can freely explore, and they can string them together in ways to generate novel outcomes. We started dreaming up something similar for Rock Band VR. We initially called them phrases, but now they're combos. And in a way, this might be dangerous, right? It's one thing to take a sport that's already kind of formally and, uh, judged aesthetically and incorporate those rules into your gameplay simulation. It's maybe another thing to judge players' creative output in an activity that's never really been scored. Uh, or not. I think the way through this is to utilize genre tropes to understand what constitutes a thing that feels like rock and roll versus something that doesn't feel like rock and roll. Well, rockists might suggest to you that rock is this kind of true art form where any expression is possible. It is just as formulaic and has just as many genre tropes as things like house or trance. Uh, and we'd already kind of established comfort in term, uh, with this in terms of performative tropes, uh, choosing to detect a limited notion of motions and stances rather than detecting only the fact that you're moving rhythmically. So we were on a path towards a kind of genre-oriented notion of how we were using these little gameplay primitives. We're relying on those same tropes, formalizing common rock progressions and patterns and rewarding those. So an example of that, just the absolute most simple one, is to pick a chord and stick with it. Call this a steady. Or pick two and alternate for four beats each or two beats each. I built this insane tool that allows you to define a combo, to say what its pattern is in terms of A's and B's and C's, to suggest that it might have a parent that it might be mistaken for, i.e. a pattern that's very similar to it, and you then parent it to it to make it not mistakable for the other, uh, deprecated because I often come up with ones that we need to delete. Uh, and then we can make these for solo only, rhythm only, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then per pattern unit, we can define which chord shape you should be playing, how long you should be playing it for, uh, what the strum speed is, et cetera. And so that's just, this is just a steady and an alternator as viewed from the perspective of that gameplay tool. And we continue to use this to this day to develop and add new combos into the game. I've also built a kind of crazy set of script exporters that takes this data and puts it in a format that our game can use that also compares all the patterns to one another and ensures that they are ultimately in their own unique detection space, i.e. no one pattern unit is going to be mistaken for another such that it is, the entire combo gets mistaken mistaken for another combo. So this introduces a bunch of creative freedom, but we also need to score it. And so we started, now we have these combos, we're asking ourselves, how do we assign score to this creative output? Should we reward feats of dexterous play over restrained play? Can you win at playing guitar? This combo system had started to push the game away from being a rhythm game and into a new space, that of a music game. And in the game, we ultimately sort of paper over minor rhythmic mistakes that you make that on a frame-to-frame -frame basis that might have caused you to lose a streak in rock band in favor of encouraging players to reproduce bits of musical form and structure like a musician does. Some of these are harder to pull off than others, like those first two examples. Those are really simple. But we could have a really hard one, like a thing called a chordiacopia, where you're playing four different chords, uh, two beats each. Which leads us back to this inevitable question. How are we assigning the score? Should we give more points to players who attempt more difficult phrases? Can you win? If you've won, Steve Vai already won. If you can win, he already has. So I think it's kind of a new moot point. He's number one guitar champion of all time. Uh, but this makes me deeply uncomfortable. I think to Frank's a point in his introduction about my obsession about detail, this is a thing that like, my team sometimes wants to wring my neck about. Because when we're saying, hey, can we assign various points to these combos? Can a steady be worth less than an alternator? I'm like, no, because that means that you're saying that the Ramones are a worse band than yes. And that makes me deeply uncomfortable. I don't want to reward busy, varied guitar play over simple repetitive play. I don't want to send a message to the players that yes is a better band than the Ramones over my dead body. So we decided that a phrase that we can detect is always worth more than a phrase that we can't. That is to say that we decided that working within genre constraints in the context of playing rock band is better than not, and endeavored to flesh out our phrase system so that we could capture a, major a majority of pre-existing genre tropes. This led us to one of my favorite design 
issues I've ever had, which is that uh, punk rock is a dominant strategy. <laughs> i.e. if we let players get by with the simplest phrases like a steady, we can expect some number of players to stick with this way of playing. If we forbid them, we make it impossible for someone to get a good score while keeping within the genre tropes of rock guitar playing. This is tough. This isn't solved right now. We're still experimenting with potentials of diminishing returns and similar, uh, but ultimately, this isn't real, like, what we found is that players who were sticking with steadies weren't really necessarily doing much different than when they sort of stuck with the chord cue from the beginning and played that same chord. Ultimately, it's really difficult for us to tell whether you're lazy or a punk, and often both. <laughs> So these rhythm phrases happen largely in the context of your head at first, right? And we, you would do them, you're counting out your beats in your head, you're doing your steady, uh, and we would give you a little banner at the end, and we weren't, so we weren't distracting you with this kind of HUD showing you real-time information. And I'd figure that players could learn these phrases without visual feedback, given that each chord has its own unique sound. I thought players could use the resulting audio to track their progress along the way. But no one listens. Without visualizing it, we really just really couldn't get players to understand what combos were. Uh, players just assumed they had to play the chord prompts, stayed on the chord prompts, the whole section, never experimented outside of that. Uh, and this led to coverage around our uh, PAX debut of this kind of gameplay that suggested that the entire game was now style over skill, when I can tell you that in a number of ways this game is far more difficult to excel at than traditional rock band. Uh, but no one listens. No one could understand this phrase system uh, without visual treatments for it. Everyone looks. Visual culture, I think, is, is dominant in a lot of ways, uh, especially in the context of games. So we started to build a visual language for phrases. There's a, a, a kind of slide of prototypes of, uh, of visual languages that I was experimenting with, trying to expose both the actual patterns themselves in terms of what you played, in addition to kind of templatized versions of the patterns that explain to you how you might build a pattern like that for yourself. Uh, we also allowed players to see chips in construction, which is very useful for novice players. But it becomes increasingly unnecessary for people as they grow comfortable for the system. This is the thing that's on my mind right now. How do we guide people through this, uh, this, this time of requiring this visual uh, uh, aspect of phrase systems to reach the place that I quite enjoy playing, wherein you don't really have that visual uh, crush. You have just your ears to rely on. So uh, I think it's best understood in the context of a video. So uh, this is a, an oddly shot video. This is the Oculus Rift on a chair with me s performing for it. You can't see me because I'm not in VR, but you can see the guitar. So you can see the guitar and then off in the distance uh, is the, the visual HUD that's demonstrating uh, these chord prompts. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to see if I can make this full screen, but I don't know why. I'm just going to end the slideshow for a second so that uh, I can show you this full screen because it's going to be much better that way. Lame. Oh. Narrow window of success. And in one second, we'll be back. Oh, yeah, look at that. So the, the, the symbols that you see filling up there are uh, represent a bar of playing a given chord. And you can see that as you play each one of these, these combos, it's kind of recognized. Uh, we give you a point score for it. We show you the name of the combo that you played. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit later about how we get players to understand and discover these types of combos. This is the kind of core nature of gameplay within uh, Rock Band VR. Uh, you are reproducing these different combos uh, in time with the song. And here this person's got a perfect, or that's me actually, 
this person, uh, got a perfect section bonus because they were able to play uh, combos that added up to the total number of bars in that section. So that's one of the aspects of strategy in the game is that if you play, there are combos of different lengths, right? So there are combos that are two chips long, four chips long, eight chips long. If you get into an eight chip long combo and start a four chip long combo in a section that's only 10 bars, you're gonna lose two bars of potential combo that you could have had. So there's kind of space filling aspect of trying to find combos of best fit given the combos have varying lengths. So players need to select the right length of combos uh, in order to uh, fit them in a given section and earn the maximum number of points. We also started to, uh, to find out that like players weren't easily weren't experimenting enough necessarily to, to identify and find these combos on their own. So we started to add this new system uh, called combo cues, which is pretty simple. Uh, we were uh, just having players uh, get combo suggestions essentially throughout play. So here you can see there's two rows of pink chips. Uh, this is just telling you, hey, if you play pink chips here, we're gonna give you a little point bonus for that. This allows us to, uh, to uh, try and coax players that are kind of actively avoiding making creative choices into doing so. Uh, this is a result of a handful of things. In, uh, one, combo discovery, but also uh, the fact that we were observing people continuing to struggle with performance paralysis where players wouldn't form combos uh, and again would just play the same chord cue the whole section and were resisting making creative choices. I wonder sometimes if this is due to fundamental things about the way that players address games but I think it's largely due to preconceived notions of what a rock band game should be. Um, still an open question we're considering is uh, how many combo cues is enough? How should these be spaced out through gameplay? How can we use these in easier songs to show people how to chunk sections for themselves? Uh, and how can we utilize these uh, to add little bits of gameplay challenge without making it feel as if the game is no longer about your own creativity and without that feeling central and without kind of tempting players into a world wherein the entire game becomes combo cues and then we're back in this world of staring at the HUD 100% of the time. Chord following. So chord following uh, was a thing that came out of uh, the combo system and just kind of my organic playing of the combo system. So one thing to note about chord, uh, or one thing I said earlier, but just to, to uh, remind you about uh, the rhythm, freestyle rhythm guitar system, is that chord positions are agnostic sonically, i.e. you can play the same two buttons anywhere on the neck and it's gonna sound exactly the same. And we would sometimes get complaints from players that the, sh the position didn't matter. They expected a change in sound when they moved the chord up and down. And we could have made those positions map to inversions of the chords, but those are really subtle, people wouldn't listen to them uh, or wouldn't he hear them at all. We could change notes, but that would sound really dissonant and the whole purpose of this freestyle rhythm guitar system was to spare the player from having to learn the nuances of actual music theory that allow you to play music. Uh, moreover, there weren't enough buttons on the guitar to cover the whole host of uh, notes you would need. Moreover, uh, we would get complaints from players that the sound of the guitar would change unexpectedly. And this is due to the fact that our freestyle system intelligently changes chords along with the song. At the same time, I was playing this game a lot and realized that I was switching the position of my, uh, my chords when the chords changed in the original song mostly because it felt more convincing to go back to that simple guitar play idea. Uh, and because it felt more convincing, it was more fun to play that way. So this became a mechanic in our game, just like on, like you see a guitar player kind of bar chord to play, uh, to play chords up and down the neck. We ask that players change position in time with the real guitar part. And it's super fun if you're in the least bit musical. It's hard for players to get a hold of first, and we had a handful of players, but we had a handful of players take it to, to it immediately and have racked up high scores with little guidance. It's a mechanic that rewards familiarity with songs, and it feels closer to the task of playing guitar on stage than any previous rock band game has. Rock Band's super precise rhythm and button matching is rigid in a way that live performance isn't, and it's abstracted to a degree that it resists memorization. There's nothing to latch onto as the colored buttons don't have a fixed role song to song, section to section. But chord changes, song structure, that's a thing that's easy for us to memorize, and it's memorized implicitly by all of us when we learn to sing a song by heart. Moreover, it uses your ears and your memory, not your visual senses, so you're free to be spatially immersed in the game while you play. For players who need a bit of, of sense of, of, of help for knowing when these chord changes are happening, 
We took a cue from real live band performances and made your bandmates also switch chords along with you so you can look to them for a cue, drawing you further into the space narratively. If we think back to the, one of the spam prototypes that we never made, the notion of playing rhythm and then moving when the pitch changes, this turned out to be very similar to chord following. And without the necessity of a track-oriented HUD, we were free to explore an idea like this. It also manages to solve the problem of punk rock being a dominant strategy. It's going to be a little bit tough to explain. I'm just going to gloss over it mostly. But these hard lines on the far left are moments when you're going to have to change your root position. And ultimately, the easiest sets of combos to play are the combos wh that whose own internal phase, their own internal rhythm, is in sync with the original song itself. These are the actual two sets of combos that I played uh, in the video we watched earlier for David Bowie's Suffragette City. And playing these particular sets of combos uh, makes for a far easier, easier experience than just playing the exact same chord and moving it up and down the neck uh, because it allows you to do very simple things like just drop one finger and you've effectively changed the root position of your chord, the lowest button pressed. Getting towards the end of it. Uh, Rock Band Gameplay Overdrive. Uh, so we were happy with our gameplay system. It had a lot to offer. It was creatively inspiring. Uh, but we had not really figured out what we are going to do with motions and stances. At first, we had a system where we were rewarding them all the time. But that was really exhausting. And it encouraged people to just kind of spam motions and stances all the time. So we made a very simple change here. Stances deploy overdrive. Uh, and motions earn overdrive, but only while in overdrive. So the moment when you start being in overdrive, you have to start being very performative, headbanging the whole time. And as long as you can keep that going, you can extend overdrive with that motion. It has this feeling of kind of like build up and release that uh, works incredibly well. So just to recap our mechanics, chord prompts, when prompted to play a specific chord, chord following, change the position of your root fret when the song changes chords, break your shriek if you change root fret at any other time. You can play any of the combos in the game, you can play the cued combos, and you can earn overdrive with stances and extend it with motions. Here's where we're ending this talk, Rock Band Gameplay, how I'm spending my winter break. So what I've been doing a lot of lately is trying to think about the ways in which all of these different aspects of input intersect with one another and intersect with the pre-existing song structures of songs to help, understand, help me understand what constitutes a level in the game and how we should be leading players through these sets of increasingly complicated mechanics. It's not the case that a novice player is going to step up to this game and be able to reproduce combos with chord following and actually enjoy that uh, and not feel entirely overwhelmed. And starting to think about more ways that we can have uh, these different aspects of gameplay impact one another and be tied more closely to one another so that players that are performing at the highest level with any one of these mechanics uh, can see opportunities to perform at higher levels with others. Also been thinking about what the song mastery process is going to look like and how we can encourage that within the game. So if early on, early on people are getting prompts and maybe a handful of combos, uh, over time, they're kind of optimizing their phrases or their combos along with chord following, finding ways to maximize overdrive. And also thinking about uh, where we could make a mode that's like really anti-musical and like kind of my worst nightmare, where we're just creating arbitrarily difficult sets of combos to play over chord following, where we're trying to, to forcibly push against uh, this, uh, this notion of aligning your combos with the existing chord structure of the song. Also thinking about how we're going to break these mechanics up across skill levels, uh, whether we're going to still have a version of the game that people can play that has absolutely no mechanics at all. It's just this kind of guitar toy. Uh, and also what we're going to end up with in terms of the visual treatment. This is fresh off the presses today from our lead artist. Uh, thinking about how we're going to demonstrate this and deal with color blindness uh, with regards to this gameplay system. Uh, and that's about where we're at right now. Uh, I think we found a livable balance between instruction and choice where players ultimately can feel ownership of their own performances. And in genre constraints, we found a means of quantifying the unquantifiable. Uh, we still refuse to assign, or I still refuse to assign, relative value within that constrained space. And we learned that music gameplay is not antithetical necessarily to spatial immersion, but that rhythm gameplay might be. This all comes down to whether you're asking the player to track something that there is moving in space with their eyes. Ultimately, one of the things I've learned is if you scroll it, they will look. Thank you.
you so much, Matt. That was amazing. Um, look at this. We have, uh, we're just a little bit of Q&A. Cool. Um, we have microphones. Uh, so you can, uh, you want to... Pull that stool over. You want to stay yeah, where you are? No, no, no. no. Bring, I'm it, just, bring I'm it over. Doing, I was just doing this. And then just okay, putting yeah. the thing up. Nice. And um, yeah, I love that talk. Um, one of the things that. Is this on? Hello. Hi. Hello. Do I need to do something? Brenda. Oh, my, oh he's going to do it. Um, I mean, just like. Think, let's do this where we share it. Okay. What do you think of that? Yeah, I like that. You like that idea? Yeah. Um, it's just amazing to me, like this is the kind of talk I love, because it's like a super deep dive into like the process of solving a game design problem. And I just if I get, it's thinking about what we just witnessed, right? Which was um, how you, you take a known quantity, which is rock band gameplay, right? It's a known thing. Um, and you change one aspect of it, which is let's do it in VR. And it, and it opens up this whole Pandora's box of, of like, and, 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 and your talk just like showed us how step by step, um, if, if you're a real, you know, if you're an honest designer who's really wrestling with, with um, the, the, the truth of, of, of the materials that they're, they're dealing with, and you're not, you're not kidding yourself, and you're not just gonna smile your way through a problem, um, then you just end up in, like having to like do like having to, to like navigate through this really com this complicated design terrain. Um, and it also made me think of, I don't know if you came across this article that was posted recently. Um, it's a very well-written article by um, a woman, I think her name is Catherine Neal, is that right? Catherine um, O'Neill. Catherine um, and, um, and she was talking about um, the, the sort of cultural history of video games and design and, and how yeah, that right process is. You, did you read this thing? Yeah. And, and her big thing was like this, um, you know, why haven't we developed more self-conscious, um, formal, analytical design tools? Um, and, it, and it struck me as, I think it was a really interesting article, but it also seemed to me like misguided in a way. Um, because it's, it's just not that simple. It's never the case that you can that you can sit and just use these tools. And your example was so good at showing how the process actually works, which is it's always this weird, messy blend of instinct, uh, craft, and tradition, um, trial and error, experimentation, and, and then formal abstract design tools. Like at a certain point, you do end up like with this wonderful kind of like multi-dimensional morphological expression of the design problem. But it's not like you start there, right? You start there trying the most obvious thing and hoping that it works. Mm -hmm. you know? and, then, and then you have to trust your instincts and then, you, and then you try some random things and then you kind of list out the things you've tried and you say, well, what's wrong with them? Then you start applying these more analytical tools. Um, so anyway, it was, a, I, it was just I, a wonderful talk. I, yeah. I think that oftentimes it, it benefits you to avoid trying to uh, compare the work you're doing to other work in, in its very nascent state. Because it tends to, I think, lock down potential avenues. And I think one of the differences that I have with some designers that I absolutely adore that I work with is, is just an unwillingness to accept a previous existing solution and trying to take things on their own terms. I think that's something that, uh, that is a quality that tons of harmonics games have and tons of harmonics folks have uh, that I think ultimately makes for better work. Uh, and I think so what when, you say when you are when you're relying on on the same tools to solve the same sets of problems I think you're likely to uh, to generate more uh, or less diverse work more monotonous work hmm. ultimately at a certain point in time down the line you can recognize the similarities that, that work might have to other work but if you start from I think the formal abstract tools and try and fit your problem into those tools right. you're going to close down avenues that are difficult to explain or that haven't been gone down before. And I believe truly that the work that we've been doing on Rock Band VR is unprecedented in a way that we couldn't have gotten to if we didn't just actually send the audio team off to go build a toy and then have the audio team come to me and be like, hey, what this thing is, we're gonna make it into a game. And that, that intersection there, I think, is where the magic started to happen. Yeah, and it's so interesting too because you ended up, like, you're wrestling with these these really deep issues about the nature of music in general. It really made me think about 
what is happening when people just get together to jam. Because that is a situation in which there is both the kind of creative freedom to do whatever you want and a kind of constant evaluation that's happening, where people recognize whether or not it's working. Mm -hmm. And this question of invention and creation on the one hand, a, a sort of free exploration of the possibility space of what you can do, and on the other hand, this constant evaluation, which is, which is present, but it's not, it's not crushing the thing, right? It's not crushing the, the exploration. It's not, but it's there, and we all recognize it, and even in improvisational music, too, it's obvious when it's there and you're, when you're, you have sheet music and you're, and you're playing along and you're trying to make it sound right and it doesn't sound right. But even when it's a, it's a jazz, you know, like it's an improvisational jazz context, um, there's still a sense in which you're, you're evaluating this thing and, and you're searching for and you're trying to push it in a certain direction um, and yet it doesn't feel like a math test, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, that's just weird that in making a game about this, um, you have to kind of reinvent that. And it's like, and it, the whole thing has been turned, you know, like, uh, like 45 degrees, you know? So it's no longer just music, but in a way it, it is still music. I, I don't know, man, it's, just, it's really, really interesting. I find that part super frustrating, yeah. honestly. Like the, the differences between what it is uh, as a musical si system of expression and what it is as a gameplay system uh, can be really frustrating. Because so. you, start, you start interacting with it and you start showing it to people and they start playing it and then they start evaluating it in terms of dominant strategy as if they aren't having an aesthetic experience and they aren't curating that aesthetic experience for themselves, right? Like to me, it's like this, there's no such thing as a dominant strategy in this space because you should do a thing that sounds good to you. You should do a thing that you like doing. You should take uh, an aesthetic appreciation of the work that is is being created by you in real time, that should be part of the calculation you're making as to how you're succeeding in this space. If you succeed and it's really unpleasant for you, then I don't think you're playing this game right, right? I just, I just don't think that, that you're playing the game right. And a musician would never, would never be like, oh, well, the easiest thing for me to do is just play G. So I'm yeah. just gonna like, or do G. Yeah. This soul song's G. Yeah. I don't want to do anything else other than G. Yeah. Open tuning all the time, right? Like, yeah. That's just not it's, not, it's not the way they would go about doing it. I, and I think that people put too hard of lines in between the way that they're approaching something that they assume to be a game and something that they assume to be a creative system. Right. I think we're, we're playing tug of war in that space. I'm not sure that we've like definitively won, that, like, that what we've invented is, is uh, like truly solves the problems that I've, that I've brought up. But I think it's the closest attempt, and I think what I'm proud of about it is that it is like music, right? It does bring up those same sets of issues, which our, our rhythm games have never done, right? They, they, they're about time, and they're not about music. They're not about the kind of uh, structural aspects of music. They're not about the, uh, the kind of inventive performative aspects of music. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's funny. I, I, I played a lot of rock band, and, and um, I played a, rock, a lot of rock band with my son, James, and um, when he... Before he started playing rock band, he had taken guitar lessons, but he'd never really played the guitar and didn't really like it. And it was through the, the process of playing rock band that he sort of discovered um, a real love of the guitar and is now a very good guitar player. And, and music is a part of his life and playing, playing music on the guitar. And, and it's, it's interesting because there is this uh, um, ambiguity about the the level of representation that happens in in rock band, like on a naive level, you look at a at a rhythm action game and you're like, oh, it's simulating what it's like to play a guitar. And then at a certain higher level, you realize, well, no, it's actually nothing like what it's like to actually play a guitar, right? Um, but the thing then at, a, at an even higher level, the the way in which I think for him it 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 clicked was the thing that was being simulated was not the way your actual fingers move when you play a guitar, but it was simply practice. <laughs> it was simply the, the habit of realizing, oh, I, could, I can confront a thing that sounds bad and, and feels wrong, and just by dedicated study and guided practice, get good at it. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that was captured in, in, in Rock Band. And, and it's a, in a weird way, I think what you guys are onto now is another sort of higher level representation. So even though it's not 
a one-to-one -one correspondence, I think there is an, an yeah, you're, you're simulating that, that relationship on, a, on, a, on an even different level. Yeah, I, th I think one of, the, one of the things that's always been central to the musical educational aspects of Rock Band is to your earlier point of like, uh, is what it is, right? Like what guitar playing is, what that even is. If you are not a musician, if you're not a person who listens and unpacks the music you're listening to, you don't necessarily have a way of saying, this is a guitar part, this is a synthesizer part, this is a bass part, this is a drum part. One of the nicest things that Rock Band does is like take that complex Italian sandwich of a rock song, like peel apart each part for you and mute and unmute it for you so you know, oh, that's what a guitar does. Right. And like when, uh, when we first started having Rock Band and Guitar Hero around my apartment and when I was back playing in my band, it was around the same time that like, my friends would start commenting on particular parts from particular instruments mm -hmm. that they liked. Mm -hmm. And before they were like, oh, I like this song. But they were like, oh, I like this bass part. And mm -hmm. I think that that part of like, understanding which instrument is what, what role they're taking, uh, how they act in songs is the thing that, uh, that Rock Band definitely aided uh, people's understanding of. Here, I think we're starting to delve into the aspects of song form, right? Of, uh, of patterns, of repetition, of uh, musical counting, counting on bar boundaries, right? Things right. that are like closer and closer and closer to music because rhythm doesn't really require you to understand the way that, that songs are chunked up in the same way that song structure... You mean the, the traditional gem highway yeah. copying it's, it's a, it's a yeah. continuous flow, right? right. Like it's, it's, it's more like a waveform representation of sound rather than a score, right? right? right. And so it's like, oh, it's just a song and the song goes, right? But if you think about right. score, a score is like really chunked. It's, right. it's, it's, it is where music looks the most like math. Mm -hmm. And we're edging people closer to that and trying to tell them, this is like Tony Hawk. Like, yeah. <laughs> and hopefully that's a thing that, like, that a bunch of people enjoy. Uh, yeah, it's funny when you... I, I, I like it. Yeah, when you, when, you, when you put up that SXX tricky uh, slide, I was, it's something a uh, light bulb went off in my head. I was like, oh yeah, I can see the relationship between those. Um, we get are, into like weird nuanced problems where in like, uh, so we're searching for combos all the time, right? And like, this is the problem of solving like right now. So we're searching for combos all the time. The way we search for combos is we look at the past X bars that you've played and we say, was that a combo, right? And so you can be intending to play something, but have played a bar, like a bar of something that wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. And then we look back and we're like, oh, that's this combo. And you're like, no, 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 I was trying to play this other combo. And in a fighting game, if you were like, oh, I meant to do a Hadouken and I got a Dragon Punch, I, you'd be like, well, you pushed the wrong buttons. Yeah. But here we're weirdly obliged to solve that problem. And I can't <laughs> even tell whether we're obliged to solve that problem because uh, this is so new and we want people to feel like they can be intentional in this space mm -hmm. or because the way of we're making combos is so decompressed that, uh, that you can't so, like fix your problem fast enough. So we started yeah. to introduce this notion of like combo phase, mm -hmm. such that you were always making combos in a way that's in phase with the song structure, which is then authored. Uh, it, it introduces like weird complex problems that, uh, that show us how different it is, I guess, from things like SSX, even though uh, on a surface level, it seems like, yeah, these are combos, they're sequences of buttons that you're pushing over time, uh, but player expectation for them becomes really, really different. It's so funny. I mean, it makes me think of that quote. Who I don't know. Sometimes Miles Davis has said he said this. Um, There's no wrong notes, only questionable resolutions. Have you heard this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which is like, yeah, you're going from a from a system in which there's only right and wrong notes to a, to to like you're pulling back and you're saying, well, no, it's all about patterns, right? Um, and, uh, and it does seem like you could play anything if you can get out of it, yep. um, which, is, which is kind of exciting. Um, I want to know a, a little bit about how this maps onto different songs. So in traditional rock band, you have this very precise written score for how, which notes need to be hit at what points. What do you have here? Are there certain combos that that are associated with certain songs, or? So, th yeah. this is the thing we're figuring out, right? So the number of combo cues that we'll have overall in any given song is a thing that we're like, we're vacillating on on a day-to-day -day basis right now. So literally on Monday, we did an authoring pass where there was never uh, an eight bar empty chunk, or never more than eight bars empty without a combo cue. Uh, and that felt 
it felt like it was pushing far too much in a kind of instructive direction. There wasn't enough space for creativity. Um, that's one thing, right? And, but that's kind of authored by us. It's not really uh, a thing that's implicit in the song. But the chord progression, this chord falling mechanic is. And the way that I kind of think about it uh, when I'm comparing this game to like say Forza Horizon is that the chord progression of the song is kind of like the track that you're on, right? And you're trying to figure out what combination of gas and brake you need to be able to <coughs> navigate that track appropriately. Huh. And so you'll have songs that are really simple, right? That are changing chords on the downbeat and it's like a campfire song, and someone's like, G, mm -hmm. C, G, and they're just like mm -hmm. going along, playing those two things. And you can chord follow to that incredibly easily. Then you can go to a song where it's like Panama, and like Van Halen's going off, and there's a thousand chord, chord changes happening all the time, and they're not necessarily happening at points in time that, uh, that combos even resolve at, right? So you can be changing chords on a, on a per eighth note or sixteenth note basis, while we're only detecting combos that are happening on a per half note or two beat basis. Mm -hmm. uh, th those are the things from each song that become kind of uh, the things that, that modulate song difficulty. There's also a whole world we're solving like this problem in, in terms of complex meter. So songs that don't have 4-4 four, four time, which I, was not a thing that anyone would be interested in, uh, but you'll see, that, you'll see that the resolution of that come whenever this game comes out. Um, there's also uh, just the kind of cadence of song section. So like song, song structure and that map that you have of the entirety of the song that's in the game uh, is a thing that, uh, that determines the cadence of the shape cues that you get. And then as those section lengths create that fit problem that I was talking about earlier where uh, you see a section length and it's 12 bars or it's 14 bars and you're like, okay, I'm gonna need to do an eight, a two and a four to be able to fill up that space. And so we're trying to figure out how to mark those sections, et cetera, but songs end up having a relatively large impact on the exact size of each one of those problems. But I'd say the thing that's most akin to traditional rock band in terms of like songs escalating with challenge is in terms of their number of chord progressions. But it's totally possible to have a song that's incredibly complex from a performative standpoint, from a guitar play standpoint, that is incredibly simple from a chord progression standpoint. Like you can have a song that doesn't change chords the entire time where someone is just playing the most ridiculous tapping solo they could possibly do. And that would be incredibly difficult in traditional rock band and wouldn't present much of a challenge in rock band VR. But are, are there challenges? Are, 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 am I gonna have some of that same experience of confronting a song that's too difficult and failing and then trying again and getting a little bit farther and then trying again and finally getting it right? Is that traditional gameplay pattern still there? I don't think we're gonna have failure in the game. Um, I'm not interested. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, it's a long and complex history as to why Rock Band and failure have kind of been pushed farther and farther away from each other over the mm -hmm. course of the franchise. But I think that the, like, there's one view of it's like, oh, it's a party game and it's not fun to have failure at a party. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was how like, no fail mode got introduced into the yeah. Rock Band franchise in the first place. And then I think, honestly, the reason we don't have failure in Rock Band VR is because the point in time which we were making the sets of decisions that we would need to in order to have failure in the game, we didn't know enough about what our gameplay was to know whether failure would make sense in it or not. And in the early days of Rock Band VR, we had the kind of hypersensitivity around being in VR such that we were like, the notion of failing in VR might ruin someone's entire life and we cannot <laughs> do that to them. It's like a Black Mirror episode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's yeah. like if they fail in VR yeah. and, like, and the crowd boos them, like they're going to cry yeah. and, like, and their life's going to be over. And yeah. like, we don't want that on our hands. Right. Like, that was kind of the point of view around it. And I think now we've kind of like, now it's, we have a more, like, we feel kind of more uh, comfortable, I think, doing that kind of thing. But in a lot of ways, from like a, crowd animation budgeting and all those kind of sure. nice th problems that you have when you're working on something <laughs> this big, it's not a kind of easy pivot you can make. Okay, but let me, let me ask you this way then. Maybe I can... Um, you will have will time I, when you get like there, one star and you're yeah, like... Yeah, will there be things that I'm trying to achieve that, that I won't be able to get to yeah, the first sure. couple of times sure. and then I'll eventually... Be, okay, okay. I'll tell you this. Like, in order to, to get that video of me playing that set of combos perfectly with chord following being mm -hmm. perfect, I did 12 takes. Okay. Um, that's in part because chord following is tuned to be incredibly aggressively difficult right now. Yeah. And we're working on fixing that. But at the same time, performing these combos is a thing that you rehearse in exactly yeah. the way that you were talking about your son learning, learning, <laughs> learning yeah. the process of practice. This is a game 
and like that, that slide that I kind of glossed over towards the end of like the song process, the process of learning a song, uh, that's central to this experience. And the way that I like to play this game is to pick any song that is female fronted and play it and get good at it. And that usually takes 12 to 14 plays for me to develop the set of combos that I think are the most fun and sound best and fit with the chord following streak. And then you have Inter to remember them. Yeah. yeah, remember them, internalize what the chord progression of the song is, and then not mess it up. And then deploy overdrive well and be ready to headbang along with the game. Ultimately, doing all of those sets of things, the things that you're going to need to be able to get gold stars in this system, presents an enormous challenge. I would argue a greater degree of challenge than anything that we've done in the world of traditional rock band, but it's a very different kind of challenge. It exists at tactical levels in addition to strategic levels. It's not as discerning from a frame to frame basis, but it is more complex from every other perspective. Oh. Um, all right, I'm gonna ask you one more question then we'll open it up to the audience. I wanna ask you about VR in general, because um, like, what are the economics of doing something like this? Like, it's very early yet to 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 commit a lot of resources to a big VR title um, when there's still not a huge penetration. There's still not a lot of systems out there. Um, we are how, an Oculus exclusive title. How can you make that work? We how are an Oculus go? exclusive title, okay. and I think that that should maybe say enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the world of, of Oculus is a world of funded content because they yeah. are trying to build a platform and yeah. we are uh, happy to have them as a partner and happy that they're like, letting us solve this real problem, right? Yeah. And, and we're, it's, not, it, it's worth saying, I guess, that we're also including a classic mode in the game. Uh, we ended up deciding to do that, but classic mode is like uh, the HUD in your face kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and it's very different, but it's kind of, it's cool. We kind of couch it as an arcade game within yeah. the world of Rock Band VR. Mm -hmm. And also like, you have a band, they have like friends and like a whole story and they have identities and mm -hmm. they talk and it, there's like a whole other world of this game that is not the gameplay that like, I barely know anything about to be honest. Right. Um, but is uh, everything I've experienced about it is, is totally great. Um, for us as a studio, I think, the reason that we are so adamant about succeeding with Rock Band VR and the, the reason that we're trying to like take VR on its own terms is so that this game can be a kind of calling card or showpiece for our excellence within that space because we believe that, uh, that that's uh, good for the studio long term. Great, and, and, uh, and are you, I mean, there's a lot of, it's still a big question mark, isn't it? Like how VR is gonna shake out. There's so much excitement around it. There's so much potential that people feel and, and so much enthusiasm for, for what it can be. Um, and, 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 and yet there's also some skepticism, like long term, are you, uh, are you bearish or are you bullish? I'm going to say this. There are a lot of things that we could have done with Rock Band VR gameplay uh, that would have been more about VR. Uh, ultimately, this is a game that I sometimes play with my eyes closed because I don't need the prompts at all at mm -hmm. a certain point. I know what the chords are gonna be. And I don't need the assurance that the game understands what I'm doing. I know that it knows what I'm doing. I can mm -hmm. hear that it knows what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I can just close my eyes and play this game, which is to say that this gameplay is transferable to all sorts of different types of platforms, mediums, whatever you, or media, whatever you wanna call it, or whatever you wanna point out. Uh, I view this as an evolution of rock band, yep. not necessarily a, an evolution of rock band for VR. Right. Uh, I think it solves the problem of spatial immersion, but wouldn't it be great to also have that problem solved in the context of playing rock band at a party? Yeah. So that you were actually able to make eye contact with your friends that you're playing rock yeah. band with rather than be hypnotized by the screen. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'm, I view it as a, an entry in the history of rock band that hopefully has incarnations that exist within VR. Uh, ideally, I'd love to make a version of Rock Band VR that has the rest of the full set of instruments you can play in, in a network context. But I'd also love to see gameplay like this manifest in a variety of different platforms. Amazing. Um, let's, uh, let's go down and see if there are any questions. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious about like the song selection process. Um, are you guys thinking about like commercial viability of the songs you're picking, as well as like, would certain songs fit your system better in terms of like showcasing like the unique parts of it? 
That's definitely a consideration that we have. Uh, I think one of the things that, so I'm, I'm the lead designer of Rock Band VR, so that means that I have a boss, uh, and that person makes a lot of the decisions about stuff like which songs are gonna be in the game, et cetera. Uh, hugely talented guy, his name's Greg LaPiccolo, he, uh, has been in the industry forever, he's a sound designer on, uh, Thief and System Shock, and has been making games since, ever since then. Um, he, uh, has this fervent belief that any system that we make that is going to be a rock band system has to be compatible with rock music in the broadest sense possible. So while we're aware that there are particular songs that are going to be more accessible and work uh, kind of more uh, easily with the system that we have, slot into the system that we have more easily, uh, we end up selecting a bunch of songs based on their appeal, based on how much we like them, based on uh, all sorts of different label-oriented uh, negotiations, blah, blah, blah. It's complex, trying to license music. Um, and some amount of regard for how they're going to play in the game itself. This has been a kind of unique scenario because our licensing timelines are very different from our gameplay development timelines. So there are instances where, uh, where we've made decisions that, are, uh, that, are, that have been tough for gameplay to roll with, uh, to, uh, to uh, to vent my frustrations in as, in as quiet a way as possible. Um, however, I think the efforts to try and make the system broadly compatible with like a, a huge variety of rock music uh, have ultimately been fruitful. Uh, they're just sometimes uh, left, uh, or sometimes problems I wish we, we could leave for the future rather than try and attack immediately. Uh, however, we're attacking them now and uh, we will solve the problems of yeah non non standard meter and riff oriented songs etc within this gameplay system which is more of a rhythm guitar play system and I think uh, the content it works absolutely best with right now is rhythm guitar oriented uh, hmm. stuff like power pop kind of music I think works far better than others um, but we always have an eye towards commercial viability and always have an eye towards like exposing people to a handful of bands that we think are exciting and new. Uh, and that music curation process is one of the things that, like, our audio lead, Steve Pardo, absolutely adores doing. Uh, yeah, Tim. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, say more about um, the other instruments and if any of the learnings from, from guitar in VR. And maybe it's too early to kind of say some of that, but I'm just curious, like, how the learnings of guitar and VR apply to things like vocals and guitar. I know what bass would be like in this system. I have a pretty strong set of ideas about how that would work. Uh, drums are gonna be really, really tough um, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, latency in all musical applications is really a difficult problem to wrestle with. Here, we're able to mask a fair amount of latency because we're calculating the rhythm that you're strumming at based on the delta between your two most recent strums. Uh, so we're able to be pretty reactive, uh, but we're papering over a fair amount of latency with that tech. That's not a thing that's really easy to do on the drums. We can't assume that because you hit uh, a hi-hat once, you're gonna hit it again. Um, and because you hit it twice at eighth notes, you're gonna continue to hit it at eighth notes. So drums present a whole different set of problems that I don't immediately have great solutions for. Bass is close enough to this kind of guitar play uh, that I have in my head a version of it. Vocals will be quite easy to do, and there's another game that's in progress at Harmonix right now called Sing Space, which is gonna be uh, for the Gear VR, which is a karaoke title, uh, and there, I think, solving all sorts of great problems around singing that I think we would, we would follow their lead where we should make a rock band and incorporate other instruments. Um, yeah, uh, Matt, and then, and then behind you. So someone who lacks fascinating and terrifying. Like, I think I'd be super bad at this game. It seems like tutorialization is going to be a huge hurdle for you to overcome once you learn it. It seems like you're close to the system that you're happy with. I think about different things that I've learned to do combos in in different games over time, whether it be in you know, Arkham City or whatever Arkham game you want to go to, or Street Fighter, and I'm constantly like, going back and trying to read things and trying to memorize these things. And I feel like it's sort of against what you're trying to do, is having people remember these patterns. At the same time, I sort of have to remember these patterns in order to make 
these phrases. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how you're gonna get people to feel free while also constrained by this? I want them to know what their palette is, but I want them to use their palette in an unconstrained fashion, right? I want them to know, hey, I have these 12 combos. There's not like, there's 84 or 86 non-conflicting combos as of last measure, uh, which is earlier today. And the majority of those are solo combos, which are kind of Easter eggy. There's really only about 12 or 14 core rhythm combos uh, that are scattered or that, that are then multiplied by three because there are two bar, four bar, and eight bar versions of all of them. So we have an alternator and a mini alternator and a mega alternator. Uh, so our expectation is that with enough combo queuing, you'll just know what they are and, uh, and it won't take an, like all that long for you to have internalized 10 or 12 words in a vocabulary that you can have shortened and lengthened. Uh, that's not, I haven't proven that yet, I'm, but I'm, it's not a problem that I'm the most worried about. I'm the most worried about getting people to understand the whole sum total of this thing in the first place. Uh, and uh, uh, designer harmonics, uh, or half of designer harmonics, uh, Chris Foster, Dan Chase, and Dan Creighton are all attacking our first time user experience and tutorial flow right now and have taken it from a really rudimentary thing that we built for uh, our PAX and OC3 events into something that I think is, is quite rich and uh, is really great at demonstrating how the game works. Uh, we're continuing to test and iterate on that thing like our lives depend on it uh, because I think comprehension of this gameplay does. Um, yeah. The how, how is the v VR platform going to change Rock Band VR outside of the gameplay? Uh, so in a lot of ways. So uh, you don't exist. Uh, like you are a floating guitar with no hands. Um, you have no amount of personal character customization and your band is three people that are characters. And you are in a band, uh, your band has a name, all the characters have names, they have personalities. You go through trials and tribulations with said band. You're kind of playing like a uh, a series of gigs with them over the course of the game. Uh, so that's significantly different. You're not like doing a lot of equipment customization and the like. Uh, I'd say that that's like the largest thing beyond gameplay that is, that is fundamentally different uh, is just that like it is, it is a story about you joining this band uh, and you have very little control, basically no control over who that band is and uh, the experiences that they have along with you. Uh, but they like, you have like cutscenes where they're doing sort of direct address to you. You're, uh, you have an experience with them of going on tour. Um, outside of that, uh, I'm just trying to think about like what other things I feel like are central to rock band. I guess the, like it's single player, right? Like it is a single player guitar simulator, uh, which is not what most people associate with rock band. I think the first question that people ask usually is like, why are there not the rest of the instruments? And the answer is like, because we don't have 4X this amount of time. Uh, so like to try and solve these problems sincerely and, uh, and you know, picking a, a narrow place to start, I think has been helpful for us. Um, yeah, Naomi? Uh, so I was really curious when you were saying that it's hard to tell the difference between someone who was playing, um, and or just being lazy. I'm curious whether you you guys ever tried asking them whether they are punks. <laughs> we ask them why they're doing that. Uh, and so like in the game, asking them like, "Are you a punk?" And oh. then they play like a punk, and it's like, "Hey, yeah." But if they're like, "I'm a country musician," and they play like a punk, then their bandmates are like, "What the hell are you doing?" Something yeah, that's totally a thing that we've considered, um, which is to say uh, taking the existing set of combos and marking them up in terms of what genre we think they conform to, and then per song having a weighting of various combos wherein those songs are more valuable, or those combos are more valuable contextually in those songs. Ultimately, we decided that the amount of UI and shell support that that would require was kind of enormous, and we want to know that people like doing this in the first place, before we start to add those types of complexity, and we see that as like low-hanging sequel fruit. Yeah. Um, and nothing's less punk than saying, hey, I'm punk. Uh, <laughs> That's a default. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, in the back, yeah. Oh. Oh, composition tool. Yeah. I can say that the technology that we're building to do this, uh, lots of people have their eyes on it for doing that. Um, I would say stay tuned. Wow. And um, I think maybe that's it. We'll end there. And uh, I thank you very much. That was amazing. My pleasure. Great talk. Thank you for doing this. And uh, when is it coming out? When is it? I don't know if we've announced yet. But why don't you announce it here? <laughs> <laughs> Exclusive! <laughs> what is it? I think, so. I think, I think, I think Q1. Q1. I think Q1. All right, Q1. you heard it here first. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah.